something very different from the earlier part, but hopefully still about meaning change. Uh, appreciate that. Um, I don't normally work on negation, but I was a postdoc here at Yale, and I think it just marinated in my head long enough. I think that Larry and Rafaela, after a couple of years at Harvard, after being here, I was like, oh, actually, negation's really exciting. So uh, having the negation and child language experts that I know give me feedback in there, hopefully will be helpful. So I, this is just very much an early stage project. Uh, and Andy assured me that that was a good thing for this workshop. So I would love lots of feedback. It started, um, so here's, a, here's two episodes from a uh, two and a half year old. Uh, or you have to wear pants. You don't have to wear these purple pants. You can pick out some different ones, but you need to put on some pants. I want any pants. Fine, I said you can pick any you want. I am not what pants. <laughs> Same age range. Uh, hey, what's in the bag? Anything. Empty bag, right? So um, this prompted an informal socio social media discussion where many parents of younger children than that reported, oh, they say my kid says not any. I don't know what your kid is doing. But parents of slightly older children said, yeah, my kid does this too, uses any stuff with a negative meaning. Uh, and so, you know, we're if you're familiar with child language, it's not an unfamiliar pattern to have something sort of correct, but holistically misanalyzed and then do it a little bit wrong and do it right again. So I think the overall picture is something like that. Um, but it, this child uh, acquisition of negation is extremely well studied, but this particular corner of the interaction in English between negative polarity items, negative items, and negation is a little bit less so. So that's the angle I'm taking. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with this corner of English um, and language generally, you can say Alex had some cookies, Alex didn't have some cookies. Um, you can say Alex didn't have any cookies, but Alex had any cookies is weird, right? That doesn't, kids aren't gonna hear that in their input, um, certainly not with the same meaning as the first one, but really you're, they're not gonna hear that in the input at all. But this isn't just that any comes with negation, it's a little more complicated than that. So uh, you can say, did Alex have any cookies? And that's well formed, if Alex had any cookies. Everyone had any cookies. And so I won't go into the literature on that distribution of environments in which any is a good meaning, or is a good replacement for some, basically. Um, but the idea is that, okay, for a kid figuring out what any means, wow, you know, they have to figure out that you can use it in these environments, but not the simple case. Um, and if you think about what did, did not, any means, it basically means the same as the top one without some cookies having a special, specific reading. But it's a complicated, I mean, just on its face, it's a complicated learning problem for the kid to figure out what any means and the right context that license it. However, this is where the story is a little bit interesting. So um, you know, there's two pieces. There's the not and the any. When it comes to not, there's an interesting state of the literature. So children produce things like no and negation very early. It's like the earliest thing, no. <laughs> um, and they understand, maybe not with an adult-like form, but the expression of negation as rejection is very clear early on. Um, it takes a long time, so um, different ways this has been shown. Uh, the one I'm most familiar with is by Roman Feynman and Susan Carey's love, looking at not kids' understanding of truth functional negation, where you're really saying it's not, this thing is not true. Um, not really understood until age three normally, and two if you really give them a lot of help. That is interesting as uh, uh, somebody who was learning about that literature at the same time as the, I, the going sort of conventional wisdom about how kids learn any is that it's really easy for them. And that's weird because any was very hard, right? But so linguists talk about how easy it is to learn any. Um, so Lin Chu and with Ray Stephen Crane and Rosalind Thornton have talked about, hey, kids get any right off the bat. So um, Lynn Chu has shown in her really nice dissertation from UConn that children get the right licensing conditions of any, as she says, from the get-go. So they don't use any in positive environments like that Alex had. Alex wants any cookies to me, he wants some cookies. So she noticed that that doesn't happen. Um, and this other sort of work from the 90s shows that they get the right scope and existential interpretation, I'm going to pick on that a little bit, but the, the going story is that kids are good at any, right? Um, the first two pictures were not, they were stock photos, but these are my, my actual kids. And the, the one-year-old, who she's like one, two, basically, and the three-and-a-half-year-old have extremely different 
Uh, so they basically fill in the edges here. So the one-year-old can just reject things. <laughs> and the three-and-a-half-year-old can talk about, you know, there's not going to be any soccer on Friday because it's raining. Like, there's a very sophisticated production and comprehension of not any. So between one and three-and-a-half, what's going on? Um, and so I give you the pictures you could picture, like, little ones not saying much complicated. The older ones can talk about a lot. So what's that trajectory look like? So something we know about kids in the middle is that between that first negation and like rejection and interpreting negation um, or adult like, so kids will be able to say negation, but if you tell them, hey, where's the ball? Well, it's not in the bucket. They don't then look behind the house, which is crazy, right? So this is Roman's work. Is it in the bucket? Nope. Kids still don't necessarily look in the house for the thing, right? I just like, it's hard to believe. And you can give them more context and they can do better down to age two, but still, a one-year-old who can really like, you know, give the ball to daddy, we'll go do it, um, won't be able to use this kind of information to act appropriately, right? And so as, I think sometimes as a linguist you think, oh, they have, no, I don't want this thing, so they must just not have heard it right or something. They really must, they have some idea of negation um, and having been in uh, an, enough presence of Susan over the last couple years, I've really tried to work hard about like, okay, what do we mean when they learn not, right? So. Clearly, there, this is something like a truth conditional negation, like it's not in the house, it's not in the bucket. You can't think about this as rejection, it's not talking about what the kid does and doesn't want, it's really commenting on a state of affairs about the world, and that's hard for kids. And so here's a working hypothesis, um, and then I'm going I'm to spell out the hypothesis and then give you a bunch of data from me and others that I think supports it, um, and then talk about how to test it more specifically going forward. So, okay, the intermediate stage of negative words before sentential negation. So the question is like, what do they mean in that range of like two-year-olds? How do they get from just rejection to something like real sentential negation? I think that, so there has been some work on this, um, but that hasn't looked at any words for good reason. That's not normally what we're doing in English, but I actually think it provides some you know, helpful insight. Usually I think we, any is you know, oh, this restricted environment. But it's actually how we usually quantify things when we're talking about the emptiness of something um, in a more complex linguistic environment. So for adult English speakers, negative words like none and potential negation, for adult speakers of English, these are separate negations. So I don't have no cookies. For an adult speaker of standard English, it means you have some. Like somebody said, oh, you have no cookies. And I say, no, I don't have no cookies. I have some. It's, as Larry pointed out, that's kind of a metalinguistic e kind of thing, but you're commenting that, okay, you need some context to do that, usually, but it, the two things contribute separate negations. Um, but of course, there are other languages in the world where it doesn't work like that at all. So for speakers of other languages, if you have a sentential negation thing, like it doesn't, or some marker of negation, and you have another negative quantifier, then you interpret these as a single negation. And so the idea is that for two-year-olds, they have, first they have this rejecting one, then they, of course, you know, they have concepts of things like emptiness or maybe none, and so they're learning number words like one and two and three. Maybe they're also learning, so there's none here. That's different than truth conditional negation for sure. But if you learn none and any as the main thing that's giving you the negative meaning, that not, didn't, it's really kind of that extra, maybe it's extra flavor to you, but that's not really, Kind of the kids are going to ignore that for a bit. Um, as a holistic, so English speaking two year olds taking the whole, the whole thing as holistic. Um, and that's a thing that happens in other languages. So I picked a Polish example just because we were talking about Polish a lot yesterday. Um, so Janet, I don't know Polish, so hopefully this is right. Janet doesn't help nobody. That last word is, you can use it to say, who's here? Nobody, Nikomo. And it means answer to a question, so it's a negative word. It's not like anybody. If I say in English, who's here? Anybody. That's not, that doesn't mean nobody's here. That's just a weird answer there. <laughs> um, but in, that's how you would diagnose that this really is a negative word. So Janet doesn't help nobody. And Polish just means the same as Janet doesn't help anybody in English. Lots of languages work like this. You can ask Rafaela for like everything you want to know about negative con word. Um, I'm going to, I'm not exactly sure in terms of the syntactic semantic mapping what kids are doing, if it really, that's why I said a little bit like, 
I don't think of front court. I actually I don't want to say that they have something that's really like an Italian speaker or like a Polish speaker because I don't think at that stage that they really do have something like negation of the whole sentence and a real negative quantifier for the two-year-old. It seems like they're not able to do that. They want to express like I have none, and <coughs> that having the negation there in the sentence, they either they seem to ignore it a lot in comprehension or just think like oh it's part of the thing I usually say when I haven't done an A. Um, that's I think, not, I mean, it's a little bit like what adults do, but not really. There's something real for an adult. In fact, you have that. It's obligatory for a Polish speaker to have negation there. It's a classic um, signature of a negative comfort language is that you have to have this intentional negation here. So the child language is not like that. They're producing these things without this intentional negation. The idea is to them, that's not the important part. It's the quantifier. Okay, so what's the evidence for this besides some productions of any without sentential negation. So one of the most you know, strong pieces of evidence comes from a recent Glossa article um, just a year or two ago. No, I guess it's three years ago now. Um, when I found it, it was like a year or two ago. So um, showing that children in that older age, even at three to five year old, three to five year olds speaking English actually prefer negative concord readings which for adults are usually only available in other dialects of English than like quote standard English. So even kids whose parents will interpret the girl who skipped didn't buy nothing as sort of rejecting the fact that she bought nothing. So you would, for me, I would say that in a context where you say, hey, the girl who skipped bought nothing. And I say, no, the girl who skipped didn't buy nothing. I think she bought a cup of tea or something, right? Um, and so, but for kids, they'll take that sentence and interpret it with what they say is a concord reading, meaning one negation, right? They won't interpret it with the positive reading for an adult, which cancels each other out. Intriguingly, uh, Japanese, which I don't know a lot about, but uh, I do know that the words that use for question words, um, you can put question word marking on things, and you can have basically ambiguous interpretations, um, and kids, prefer concord readings. So basically, they prefer to have this word interpreted as basically two, as the second expression of the same negation rather than um, a negative polarity item. So there's evidence that like this concord, multiple expressions of things that are negative, it comes easily to kids. It's what they prefer. Um, I think as implicit in this by the linguist is the idea that the sentential negation is there. And so what's weird is that kids think this quantifier is concord, basically. <coughs> But actually, I suspect that what is that it's this intentional negation that is not so much there for the kid. And so if you kind of don't think about didn't, right? The girl who skipped bought nothing, then you get the concord reading. Versus the girl who skipped bought something, you get the quote double negation reading, right? Um, and so if they're hearing the girl who skipped by nothing, you're, I mean, I'm not saying they're ignoring it entirely. They might think it's something extra or methyl, extra expressive, but if they're not really getting the sentential negation, three to five year olds can sometimes, but they have a bias kind of against that and towards the quantifier as the expression of negation, then you expect this kind of concord like reading. This is a totally different language, but it's one I'm probably the most familiar with outside of English. So in American Sign Language, and in all the sign languages in which this has been studied, there's a very helpful phenomenon, I think, for this question, which is that negation is often expressed through the, quote, intonational system. It's super segmental. It's through the um, head shake. So this whole system of non-manual marking on your head is usually thought of as the super segmental versus the segmental uh, pieces of the language which happen on the hands. And uh, in American Sign Language, you can say it's raining. And if you want to say it's not raining, you shake your head. It's not raining. <laughs> so that's how you get the different meanings. So that's how you basically reverse the polarity of the sentence. You can have a very complicated sentence. If you have head shake throughout, it means not that. If you have a negative word in the sentence, so here's nothing in ASL, you have to shake your head at the same time. Nothing. I mean, this is just like the dictionary citation form, and she puts the super segmental marking on it of head shaking negation. And the developmental trajectory, this has been replicated over and over. Um, I should have cited Anderson and Riley's work from either late 70s on this. I'm sorry I didn't. What they found is that um, first kids Learning a sign language, do head shake negation, no problem, just like at age one, just like you know, my one year old shakes her head for negation, it's very easy. Um, it's also an adult negator. Um, and then there's an intermediate stage in which kids 
learning a sign language will just use the negative non-manual signs without the head shake. And it's just like really crazy, right? So they get this none without a head shake. Then later, again, following a sort of typical curve and language acquisition, they can put the pieces back together, and then they're getting a head shake with a negative word. So the idea, what I think is part of the story that has, hasn't been realized enough is that, or maybe it hasn't, I'm just not aware, that sort of for kids, the lexical expressions in the Asian, especially quantification, expressing something like emptiness, there's no one here, is easier, and actually this first stage would be something like no, rejection. Um, it's often thought of as a totally formal, more of a syntactic development, but I think there's a semantic side to that too. Um, so along those lines, thinking about the semantics. So in Lynn, she was dissertation, she was looking at the development of any. She did a really big, she just studied basically a lot of childless looking for any, any errors of commission. So errors of commission of any. <laughs> what you found is there's really only like 48 of them. It's a very small number in her large. So lots of times kids will express any under negation or any questions or the parents will. Here she notes that a two, one-year-old, again, right in the age range, Mom says, that seems to make orange juice, we use oranges, orange juice for babies. Kids says, me? Mom says, yeah. Kids says, I don't want any. You don't want any? <laughs> no, I'm not baby, right? So the kid doesn't <laughs> want oranges, right? Um, and Lynn, Lynn uses this to argue that kids are really good at any, right? Which is really cool. They understand that any has this negative meaning. But, I mean, notably, they're using the any there. It's true that the licensing condition, if you think of it semantically, is there, right? It's negative. Um, but right, so, but they are producing this, you know, there's these examples in the corpus of any without the negation. Um, I'll skip over this um, to say, okay, here's the hypothesis, there's kids, no, there's I'm sure much more going on, but at least, no, then nothing, uh, which we have lexical expressions for, and kids will do, then something truth conditional, like this. Um, of course, there's the language-specific knowledge, which is when you have this, and want to express this, do you do it with the same negative word? Do you have a special word that maybe gives you extra information about scopal properties, like any? Um, there's the reasons languages could work like that. Here's a couple other, I think, um, pieces of the story. So in some work um, that I did with Mikosak, Henry Kokev, and with Jesse Snedeker at Harvard, we were looking at the emergence of quantification in a new language, maybe like sign language. And no problem, you find all kinds of quantifiers, lexical quantifiers in the language. Well, you find expressions of quantification in the language very early, from the earliest cohorts. All signers of all cohorts expressed all, many, none. They all express something like none. But what's really hard to tease apart, and I can tell you about how these are listed and things like that, what's hard to tease apart is whether it's a comment on, uh, you know, of the bears, there were none. We tried to make it relational, set relational, so between this set and this set, there was no overlap, but it's pretty hard to do to be sure you're not doing some kind of, yeah, it's very hard to be sure that it's not something like the middle meaning there instead of the last meaning. Um, I think that there is, just because we're at this conference, like the Flux conference, trying to think about what this means for like a well-known cycle of language change in which um, you have something like, I did, you have a sentential negative, negative marker, and then another way you can say sentential negation is to have some kind of like, other expression of negation. Here it's something like, ah, oh, I didn't say a step or something. But you can also have negative words there, um, like, uh, yeah, I not see nothing, to kind of be emphatic about it. And then you can drop this. So in modern French, you can say, just with this last thing, you kind of drop this intention negation. And I mean, I think the ties between kids acquisition and you know, diachronic development are very complicated, and lots of people have lots of interesting thoughts about this, but I think it would be interesting to think about what it means for kids to be learning language, to be hypothesizing that it's, that your sentential negation is kind of secondary to the lexical names. Um, so how would you go about testing this? We have real pilot data looking at, okay, Elmo once doesn't want a box with no, some, any crayons. Because the thing with, it's a fine thing to say, Elmo wants a box with any crayons. Any, Elmo wants a box, Elmo doesn't want a box with any blue crayons. Elmo wants a box with any green crayons. If you have some variation, it's not that ungrammatical. You mean like a free choice, like any green, right? So for adults, they do exactly what you would expect. Elmo wants a box with any blue crayons. They're gonna pick one of those two. 
This is sort of the schematic representation of this. Big Bird doesn't want a box with any red crayons, so he's going to pick this one. Ernie wants a box with any red crayons, he's going to pick top left. And doing this actually with a kid. Oh. Daniel Tiger wants a box with any blue crayons. Okay. Is that your turn? So there's no blue in that one. Thank you so much. I love them. So she's right at the right age to that this has been observed, and she does exactly this behavior. I haven't been able to test that many kids in that age range yet. Could you um, do that one just one time? Away? Yeah, and then I that's my last slide after this. So. Daniel Tiger wants a box with any blue crayons. So adults pick the one that has blue crayons. And Thank you so much. I love them. And I have one more message. Let me see. So, also comments on this task are very welcome. I feel like, um, yeah, I, I wanted to act out task, not a comprehension task, because the kids are pretty young. They're sort of too, they're way too young to do something like a true value of a task. Um, so that's the background there. Um, basically, anything with doesn't, kids are pretty close to chance. <laughs> so doesn't really get them confused. And is looking like some because that has some older kids in it and some younger kids. But the two kids who pull that apart are right in that two-year-old range. So, um, I'm going to just end with this example. What is R still learning to do? Here's the potty. Well, what's mommy still learning to do? Anything. And <laughs> 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 no, that was good. So, thanks. Uh, if we, we could construct an experiment that would test whether there's any kind of reflex of um, split negative concord. So there's a preference in both negative concord languages typologically and in English um, yeah. for preferring negative concord rather than double negation reading of postverbal negation, right. but the opposite preference for preverbal. So you could have uh, kids know nobody fairly early on. Right. So uh, or no, uh, you know, no froggies uh, yeah. want. Uh, I guess with, <laughs> given that I'm going to claim it's negative concord, then the interesting question is like, what kind? Yeah, yes, you're right. Exactly. That would be a very straightforward thing to yeah, look into, so. whether they have a preference, that asymmetry between subjects. Yeah.